You can see how, for the Kremlin, this is exactly the scenario they were worried about, the kind of fun that can turn into a riot. This is one of the reasons why it took eight years for another American band to go back to Russia. Throughout their tour, the band was accompanied by a woman named Irina. She was there purportedly as our interpreter. But they all assumed she was KGB. They also had an American interpreter, a young guy who spoke flawless Russian, named Brant Bassett. It was kind of an odd thing, but he was with us everywhere we went until occasionally he would disappear (laughs) uh, for a couple of days, and then he'd show back up. And I had... Uh, an inclination to believe that he was CIA. He's a guy that it became obvious was a CIA plant. He was uh, purportedly an employee of Voice of America. Every time we got to a new city, hey, where's Brent? Oh, I don't know. At one point, McEwen was with the KGB handler, and he asked, where's Brent? Where does he go? And she said, I don't know, John, but, you know, everybody must have a job, and Brent... Obviously, it works for CIA. I'm trying to wrap my mind around the idea that, so your band is like traveling around for a month, and in your little group is Brad Bassett, who works for the CIA, and this woman, Arena, who works for the KGB. Yeah. It's just funny to think of them traveling with the same band. Like Marina said, everybody must have a job. The fact that the band was relying for this idea that Brant Bassett was a CIA handler on the expert advice of their KGB handler feels like grounds for skepticism. And when I asked Dave Hess, the State Department official who organized the trip, he remembered it differently. So you must have known Brant Bassett. Yeah, I knew Brant. What was his deal? Well, Brant was like a contractor. Uh, He's a a Russian language speaker. And he was a contractor and he would come as as a kind of an interpreter for the band. But he was so because in because the band has said that he was a CIA guy. Well, I, I it may have been that Brent wanted to be a CIA guy. We suspected it when he showed up with a long leather trench coat, black. Oh no, really? <laughs> yeah, and the long black leather trench coat was kind of a tip off of where he was psychologically. <laughs> also, at night he would say. I have some people to meet, and he would disappear. I don't know what he was doing, but everybody in the band said uh, Brent's with CIA. And, of course, if Brent were with the CIA, he should have been fired because he looked like he was with the CIA. (laughs) (laughs) Makes sense, right? So maybe Bassett wasn't a spy. And when I looked up old press clippings about the Dirt Band tour, I couldn't even find any mention of Brent Bassett one way or the other. It was almost as if he didn't exist. But I did find a few clippings from much later, in 2006, which mentioned a Brant Bassett. They were newspaper articles about a scandal involving a corrupt ex-congressman named Randy Duke Cunningham. And they said that Brant Bassett was linked to this scandal and identified him as an ex-CIA officer who spoke Russian and German. So Bassett was a spy. One of the articles mentioned that he had a nickname Nine Fingers, because he supposedly lost a finger in a motorcycle accident. This guy, yeah, he was in the CIA. He was also, I think they called him Nine Fingers, because yes. he had lost, is that the guy? That's the guy, <laughs> Nine Fingers. That was Nine Fingers. And he, no, he really does have Nine Fingers. Holy crap, okay. Holy crap is right. And did this mean that Dave Hess, nice, earnest Dave Hess from Davenport, Iowa, was maybe lying to me? Could he be covering for Brandt? So you you think he might not have actually been in the CIA? See, because he because he there there is a real guy, Brant Bassett, who 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 actually was in the CIA. I mean, he's retired now, but he but he really was in the CIA. Uh, I wouldn't know about that. Oh, uh, interesting. Okay. What I'm thinking at this point is, if Bassett was an agency guy who worked in Russia and was fluent not just in Russian, but in German. And he was the guy with the ideological penetration by rock band portfolio. Could Agent Nine Fingers have had some hand in Wind of Change? And assuming any of that might be true, how should we approach him? Bassett is retired now. He lives in Southern California. But I figured it was probably best not to come out and ask about the CIA and my initial overture. So we sent him a letter 
asking about his work on cultural exchanges with the Soviets. And he wrote back. It's a short letter. I have it here. He says, the cultural exchanges he took part in, quote, probably had a bigger role in bringing the Cold War to a bloodless end than anyone realized. But also that he has no desire to do an interview. So I wrote back. And this time I was a little more assertive. And I said, we've interviewed the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band. They say you were in the CIA and you were sneaking off at night. And I know you were in the CIA. So this whole thing about you being with Voice of America, was that just a cover? About a week later, Bassett wrote back. I brought the letter into the studio to open it with my producers. I went into the office yesterday and uh, there was a letter waiting for me um, from the San Diego area with a George H.W. Bush forever stamp. And it's not short. Um, Dear Mr. Keefe, you are a young man of talent with what sounds like a good project ahead of you. My purchase. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, so he, start, he starts with starts with a little pat on the head. My participation might make it a better product, but it is not in my interest to take part. I am an old man on a glide path to what comes next after this life, and public exposure is not a thing I seek. My contributions in the Cold War, first at Voice of America's Russian service, and later as a CIA officer are something I am very proud of. At Voice of America, I introduced our Soviet audience to American country music via my weekly radio show. In my CIA years, I recruited and handled agents in five languages, producing often great intelligence and getting no one killed. When I interpreted for my ambassador in her meeting with Gorby in the mid-90s, he actually writes Gorby for Gorbachev, he thought I was from the local Russian embassy, giving me the best compliment I ever had on my command of the language. I have traveled to 74 countries and lived for years in several of them with my family. I have seen the elephant. I am done. I have a quiet, retired life with my dear wife of 48 years who has an incurable cancer. Each day is precious. All the years in that strange and stressful life undercover, all those memories, both good and bad, are like layers of sediment at the bottom of a lake. Some of them are toxic. Stirring them up does me no good at all. Let's let them continue to lie there quietly. Yeah, wow. That's pretty intense, what right? What a response. But he goes on. All that said, and off my chest, I do want to answer your specific question about my affiliation in 1977, when the State Department borrowed me from Voice of America to serve as escort officer for the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band. I belonged to Voice of America then, and I would not have risked my Voice of America employment by having any contact with CIA. But later, in 1981, I joined CIA, wanting to continue my personal fight against communism, but on the front lines. I retired from CIA in 1999, when it had become a lethargic, paper-pushing shell of its former self. As for 1977, I really enjoyed touring with the band and liked them very much. They are great fellows and good musicians, but they are not competent to make identifications of intelligence officers. <laughs> Trust me on this. This is the sign-off. It's a warm and sunny day here. My wife and I have a late afternoon swim in the pool, followed by a fresh cocktail enhanced by fruit from our own trees. I will raise a toast to you and to the band with hopes for your success. Sincerely, Brent Bassett. <laughs> what a guy. Yeah. I mean... It's a huge bummer, but it's a hell of a letter. <laughs> yeah. Do you know the parable about the blind men and the elephant? It's a story that dates back to ancient times and shows up in different religious traditions. A group of blind men are out walking one day when they come across an elephant. They don't know what to make of this massive creature, and they can't see it, so they each touch a different part of the animal. One of the men feels the elephant's trunk. Another touches the sharp tusks. A third strokes its leathery skin. The story is a warning about the limits of human perception. Each monk has a clue about the great creature that stands invisible before them, but none of them can see the whole. I've seen the elephant, Brant Bassett told me. But me, I feel like one of those blind men, grasping at some great but nebulous truth that's just out of reach. <laughs> 
trying to assemble the few clues I can touch into some coherent whole. And the funny thing about Brant Bassett, maybe he wasn't in the CIA when he was in Russia with the band. But if not, what was he doing when he disappeared in each new city? The members of the band were under the impression that he might have been coordinating with dissidents or smuggling documents or information in or out. And that is the sort of thing that CIA officers would do. And we know that at times during the Cold War, it was helpful to have some kind of entourage you could move with as a cover. And this is where it gets really weird. Because we found someone who said that when the Scorpions toured behind the Iron Curtain, that's exactly what the band was doing. Okay, dude, here's what he writes. What most people do not know, however, is that during their time touring Europe and Asia, and especially the Soviet Union, they were acting as couriers for the CIA. The Scorpions were a tremendous help to the cause of democracy. That's next time on Wind of Change. Wind of Change is an original series from Pineapple Street Studios, Crooked Media, and Spotify. The show is written and hosted by me, Patrick Radden Keith. The senior producer is Henry Malofsky. Associate producers, Natalie Brennan and Ben Phelan. Joel Lovell is our editor. Consulting producer, Michael Stender Auerbach. Sound design and mixing by Henry Malofsky. Original music by Mark Orton and John Hancock. Our music supervisor is Jonathan Feingold. This episode featured Drift by Ratatat, courtesy of XL Recordings Limited and Monotone Inc and St. European King Days by Opium Flirt, courtesy of Irvin Tromafoy. The executive producers at Pineapple Street are Jenna Weiss-Berman and Max Linsky. At Crooked Media, executive producers Tommy Vitor, Sarah Wick, and Sarah Geismer. And from Spotify, executive producers Liz Gately and Jake Kleinberg. Special thank you to John Favreau, John Lovett, Allison Falsetta, Xenia Barakovskaya, Maddie Sprungheiser, Eric Menel, Courtney Harrell, Jifa Yadur, Jesse McLean, Paul Spella, Bianca Grimshaw, Saisra Skandaraja, Jonah Weiner, and Justina Gonzowska. Source material in this episode included PBS and the AP Archive. If you're listening to this episode and don't want to wait till next week to hear where the story goes, head over to Spotify. It's free to download and free to listen to podcasts. All episodes of Wind of Change are available right now for you to binge for free on Spotify. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.